Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks uh, very much for uh, attending this uh, with such, uh, such, such interest and uh, in such numbers today. Uh, my name is uh, Hervé Lamayeu. I'm a research associate here at the Institute. My uh, regional focus is on Southeast Asia and uh, have a particular interest in transitional politics in, in Myanmar. Um, we're lucky enough today uh, to have both uh, Matthew Walton and, uh, and coming later, Andrew McLeod. I'm afraid I have to apologize on his behalf. He's stuck in traffic, so will be with us within 10 minutes, he promises. Um, if he's not here, I've threatened to make <laughs> preposterous claims about Myanmar's constitution on his behalf, so <laughs> I'll speed him up a exactly. bit. Exactly. That should incentiv incentivize him. <laughs> um, so we're very honored today to bring uh, Oxford to London. Um, doesn't always happen. I know you have a very busy agenda, <laughs> um, but uh, it seemed to me like the opportune moment uh, to have a discussion on, on Myanmar, where we are in terms of uh, the juncture we've reached. Um, uh, it's been several years of dramatic change and many continuities, um, and it seems to me that uh, it's the opportune moment now to sort of take stock of what has happened, what hasn't happened, and uh, and and what may still be in the pipeline. Um, and there, you know, in, in Matthew, who is the uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi senior research fellow for modern Burmese studies at St Anthony's College um, in Oxford. Um, is a specialist on uh, on uh, Buddhism and and the uh, sort of political the nexus between politics and Buddhism in in, in Myanmar, and Andrew McLeod uh, comes from a different uh, uh, direction, which is a more constitutional and and legislative focus. So I think together uh, we we should have a very interesting discussion, uh, sort of the, the politics from below and the politics from above, and what what that means and and and, and in terms of where we're heading as we approach uh, the elections in 2015 and and beyond. So without further ado, I think I'll leave it to, to Matthew um, to, to start on uh, essentially what's been happening um, from below. And in light of the, the Mandalay riots, I think it's, uh, it's uh, probably another um, useful reminder that this isn't just a peripheral concern, either geographically constrained to the Rakhine state or thematically, but is very much shaping the, the political and social agenda in, in Myanmar. So Matthew, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Great. Well, thank you to Hervé and to IISS for the uh, invitation uh, here today. It's a great opportunity to, um, you know, to talk about about this. And, and Hervé, you made mention of the the violence in Mandalay. You know, this has just happened, right? And and we're unsurprisingly still getting conflicting reports about what is going on, who's doing what, who was responsible. Was there even a Buddhist maid employed by this uh, by these Muslim? Um, proprietors who were, were accused of, of rape. And so happy to talk about this a bit more, um, just with the caveat that we still don't know much. But I think two easy conclusions that we can reach from this is that these kinds of incidents, these sorts of, of, of riots and flashpoints are going to continue to occur. And the incentives for violence, for kind of riling people up according to religious identity, uh, are going to increase as we get closer first to the by-elections at the end of this year, and then, of course, to the big elections at the end of 2015. So I want to make three points today. Um, Andrew helpfully reminded me yesterday that in our allotted 15 minutes, that means about three points that I can uh, feasibly talk about and you can reasonably digest. And, and um, then I want to say something. Uh, it, it's going to... The, the peace process and ethnic conflict is going to seem like an afterthought just because I'm going to focus on religious conflict. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It is not an afterthought. It is central to these problems, and we'll kind of hear the way that they come together, but uh, I want to say a word about that as well. So the three points here. First of all, political allegiances and identities and interests in Myanmar are not as simple or unitary as many uh, people have expected. Second, m and this is something I've been saying for the past year, uh, I'll, I'll repeat it here because I think it's still relevant uh, and important, most of the responses to violent and exclusionary rhetoric in the country are still not effectively responding to the arguments that monks and other nationalists are making or to, to the logic of those arguments. And then third, something that's, that, that's a bit new that I'm kind of testing out to, to get a sense of, of what you think, uh, and this this come really out of the video from Mandalay, is that hateful messages clearly seem to travel much more quickly and effectively than messages of tolerance, even when these are communicated, uh, even when the messages of tolerance are communicated by monks who have a lot of this spiritual uh, capital in the country. Okay, so the first 
the, the first point. Hopefully we've moved beyond uh, the kind of stale binary of, of evil military dictatorship, sainted uh, democratic opposition. Um, but even as, as we start to look at these new political configurations, we, you know, we often use this term democratic opposition or opposition, um, and, and we're realizing that it's, it's so much more complex than that. Clearly not all of these people who, uh, who the West identified as liberal Democrats, as human rights advocates, uh, clearly they're not all liberal Democrats. And, and that in and of itself is not a problem. Uh, it's something I'll return to in, in a moment. Um, but we, we can now see that their political allegiances and, and their interests are, are much more complex and, and varied. So, you know, so we all know that a few of the members of the 88 generation uh, students movement have said and done some pretty reprehensible things with regard to the, uh, the Rohingya in the country and, and Muslims in the country. Uh, we see Saffron Revolution monks who were, you know, on the front lines of a democratic, a semi-democratic protest in, in 2007, but who have been leading these anti-Muslim protests, anti-OIC protests, uh, protests against Western aid agencies um, perceived as being too pro-Muslim. Um, we've got Uwarathu, right, the poster child of first the 969 movement, now Mabatha, the, the Organization for the Protection of Race and Religion, uh, the, the guy who, who seems to be spouting the most anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric. But we can't forget that he also sent monks out from his monastery to protect and support uh, protesters at, at the Lepidome uh, mine site, or that he has now been very critical of the government in the way that they carried out the raid on uh, Penang Seado's uh, monastery. We have uh, the National Democratic Force, right, which was an offshoot of, of the National League for Democracy, has espoused a lot of democratic policies over the last few years, but was the first major political party to endorse uh, these uh, religious uh, pieces of legislation that Andrew's going to talk about a, a bit more, and somewhat confusingly has also seemed to end endorse the move towards proportional representation voting system. And then we've got these Mabatha monks, the, the people from the Organization for the Protection of uh, Race and Religion, who some of whom have been saying recently, hey, we're not government cronies or stooges. We don't want to be seen as in conflict with Dasu or the or the democracy movement, right? We don't we don't know how this is sort of working out, but we feel as if we have to prioritize the protection of of Buddhism right now. So you've got these uh, these these sort of strange allegiances, these multiple allegiances. I think it also reminds us that we can no longer assume. Uh, about or make assumptions about the intentions of the government or the ruling party or the president, uh, you know, or the speaker of parliament. Um, I'm not saying that I know what President Thane Sane is is thinking, but these days he and his party and the other members of parliament have to deal with political pressure, uh, protests of thousands of people marching in ways that they wouldn't have had to several years ago, right? So we can't discount the political pressures on them to. Uh, enact anti-Muslim legislation or discriminatory legislation. So these complex identities, you know, aren't surprising elsewhere. Right? I uh, lived for many years in, in Seattle and Washington, and, and, you know, it was always a bit sort of surprising at first when progressive uh, land density, land rights activists in urban Seattle would ally themselves with conservative uh, ranchers and farmers in eastern Washington to come together on, on a bill to kind of protect uh, the use of land, but it seems to, w that when we look at politics in the non-West, we're, we're flummoxed or we're outraged when people uh, dare to have anything more than a one-dimensional set of political interests. And I think we really need to recognize that, that these are all complex political actors in Myanmar. And, and what that suggests is that, you know, for us as, as researchers, um, we need to allow the frameworks that we're using to understand Myanmar's politics to emerge from the politics as it is and as it's changing, uh, rather than the other way around, right? Rather than coming to this uh, with these sort of outmoded um, uh, political frameworks. But also, then, I think there's a lesson there for for funders as well. Funders who are who have been expressing increasing concern that these people, who these democratic activists that they've supported for years, are now saying very undemocratic, sort of non-liberal things. I think that funders ought to be aware of and concerned about uh, these exclusionary attitudes, right? While at the same time, leaving a lot of space for democracy 
um, and, and whatever democratic practice and democratic thought uh, emerges in Myanmar to be something that's very different than the liberal democracy that we're used to in the West. Okay, so second point that I'll go through relatively quickly. I think Uwaratu and, and, and the monks uh, that have been making these nationalist Buddhist arguments, these arguments are Buddhist in many ways, right? But they're not necessarily doctrinally Buddhist. And I think this is, a, this is an important point um, that I've written about in, in a lot of places. And I think it, it, it still uh, isn't working its way into the responses very well. Uwaratu's arguments they make reference to Buddhism as a kind of cultural identity, as a political identity, right? This is about Buddhism, at, or Myanmar as a Buddhist nation. This is about the existence or disappearance of Buddhism. This is not about uh, what the Buddha preached necessarily, right? So what that means is that responses, right, responses that promote tolerance, that, that work against violence, need to directly address this logic, right? They can't just be these sort of empty... Uh, sayings, Buddhism is a religion of peace, you know, Buddhism promotes tolerance, you know, Buddhist people need to love other religions and accept other religions. That all may be true, but it's not an effective response to the logic that uh, Buddhist nationalist monks are, are using. So so there, there are two kinds of things here. I mean, first of all, what has to happen as part of the responses is that, that the governments, po other policymakers, civil society groups, foreign donors and investors need to more directly acknowledge and, and address the underlying so social, economic, political uh, causes of, of the anxieties in places like Rakhine State, in places like Mon State and Lashio um, and, and in, in central Myanmar. Right? But then the other thing that needs to happen is that monks in particular and, and other religious actors need to be directly refuting the logic uh, that Uratu and others are, are, are stating when they say we need to defend Buddhism, right? That, uh, that Islam and, and Muslims are a threat to Buddhism and therefore the ends will justify the means that, that our priority is to protect Buddhism. This is logic that needs to be refuted because otherwise uh, people in Myanmar can and are easily holding these two views that may seem to me and to you to be contradictory. Buddhism is a religion of peace. We need to do everything that we can to get these Muslims out of our country. Right? They can hold those at the same time. They're not necessarily internally contradictory. Okay, and um, then then the final, slightly more speculative uh, part, and I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to, to see if anyone has any thoughts on this. There's been discussion in the last couple of days, both online and almost in kind of dueling uh, media headlines about the role of monks in Mandalay. Uh, so you've, you've seen uh, some some articles that say, oh no, the, the, the monks were the ones trying to stop the fighting and the rioting in Mandalay. Um, and there's video of monks that were talking down rioters. Some of you have probably seen this. It's, it's sort of like a scrum and, and a few monks in there trying to get people to to go home. This is similar to what happened in some uh, uh, places in Metila where there was fighting in, in Yangon where monks protected Muslims in their monasteries, right, and, and stood in front of, uh, of violent groups of, of rioters. So what this suggests is, you know, on the one hand, a good thing that monastic authority still holds to some degree, although the video suggests that it may be even more tenuous uh, than we would expect because you've got this the video is kind of fascinating because you see these monks standing here and you see, you know, Burmese, presumably Buddhist rioters kind of standing in this respectful pose, listening to the monks and the monks say, please go home. We're here. We will investigate this. We'll take care of it. And, and still standing in this respectful pose, people say, no, no, we know that guy's responsible. We'll take care of it. Paya, right. Uh, sort of, you know, Reverend Monk. Well, so, so it's this weird, um, Respect, but but really kind of an, antagonistic um, uh, respect, and and I think the the point that I want to make here is that video captures one moment, right? One encounter between a group of monks and a group of protesters or rioters. One of the triggers, it seems like, of these these Mandalay riots was. Um, an alleged rape of a Buddhist woman by Muslim men, as, as, as allegations have, have been um, put forward in, in so many of these cases, that was spread very quickly on Facebook, um, you know, through some blogs, including through Uwarathu's uh, Facebook page. 
there, in that instance, the monastic authority, the spiritual authority and moral authority that comes from monks certainly amplifies um, the the importance that people attach to this, right? The the need, the um, the feeling that you have to do something uh, about it, and and so we can imagine a scenario because it's it's happened all across the country where someone uh, sees a group of friends and says a monk just said you know a, Bo- a Buddhist woman was raped by Muslim men we need to get together and we need to take action right and that spreads that spreads on Facebook that spreads person to person that spreads through all of these different networks kind of on and offline I think it's a little harder to imagine. Um, the people in that video that some of us have seen who have been quieted down by the monks going back to their neighborhood slowly and quietly and saying, the monks said we need to calm down. So let's all just go back home. Let's disperse. Let's not worry about this. Let's just sort of let it go. I think what's much more likely is that on their way back, they encounter a group of their friends or colleagues on their motorbikes, you know, with some sticks or something saying, hey, we just heard that there's a Muslim person here who's beating up a Buddhist person. Let's go. And that monk is out of sight, out of mind. And that monk's peaceful message is out of sight, out of mind. And and I, so what worries me here, and again, I'm just sort of thinking this this through, it's, it's great that more monks are stepping up um, and admittedly taking a, a real risk to kind of maintain calm and maintain uh, peace, but the Mandalay video worries me a bit that, that it it's not certain, and, and the dynamics of, of how this is happening in places like Mandalay, it's not even certain to me that monastic authority is sufficient to say the power of rumor and the sort of mob mentality and, and the ease with which negative incendiary messages can spread through communities, through social media, things like that. So it, it, um, as I said, uh, peace process, not an afterthought, but it's just going to be a kind of coda um, to this with a few uh, thoughts. And I think there are things that Andrew might um, expound on when, when he talks particularly about constitutional reforms. It is certainly a good thing that in the last three to four months, the military has been more seriously and directly uh, and consistently engaged in the ceasefire discussions. That's absolutely a good thing. It's not so great of a good thing that now, not so great of a good thing, sorry. It's not so good of a thing that now we have a bit more confirmation as to how deep the disagreements are, the ideological, structural disagreements are between the military and uh, the ethnic revolutionary groups. So um, I think that's that's a reason to be slightly concerned. I have to say that I, you know, um, people who are who are involved in in peacemaking and and uh, you know ending wars and and making ceasefires and who have a lot of experience in these places say yeah it's obvious that as we get closer and closer to the actual signing of a ceasefire agreement uh, we see more violations we see more violence we see groups trying to position themselves really well and, that, and that's what we're seeing here uh, also in Myanmar but I do think it it seems unacceptable that as the military is uh, at the bargaining table trying to sign a a nationwide ceasefire uh, that they continue um, to fight in in northern Myanmar in in Shan State and Kachin State and that there have been at least one, I think maybe two small skirmishes in in Karen State. Um, It's it's hard to interpret this in any way other than that that they haven't really changed their their overarching attitude towards um, the ethnic minority groups and, and towards haven't changed their perspective on how they ideally want to control the country in a central uni- uh, unitary uh, way. And that, you know, that's worrying both uh, in and of itself, but it's also worrying in terms of what it communicates to the ethnic uh, revolutionary groups that are sitting across the table trying to have these negotiations about a ceasefire agreement, about codes of conduct, when the Damodal is, is uh, fighting their compatriots up in, in the north of the country. Um, one of the things that I think we hear more and more, uh, so the, the, the Tamada, um members who joined the ceasefire talks uh, a few months ago uh, came in with a bang and said, August 1st, that's going to be our, our deadline for a C- national ceasefire agreement. I think it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. Um, pretty much everybody has admitted that. Uh, but but one of the things that, that we're hearing, and I think this logic makes a lot of sense, is that even if it's going to be stalled, there has to be some some uh, a national ceasefire framework by the beginning of 2015 to allow for the political the subsequent political dialogue process to start, 
because that political dialogue process has to have an opportunity to feed its way into the constitutional reform process that Andrew is going to talk about. And that constitutional reform process is going on right now, as we know, inside the parliament. Um, and it's going on in a kind of relaxed way. But if it doesn't have the inputs from the national political dialogue that emerges with the ethnic groups, um, then it becomes a kind of USDP-controlled, military-controlled uh, process. Um, the Unfortunately, I think, uh, the best case scenario that I see is even if there is a national ceasefire, ceasefire agreement, um, is that this ends up being, like in so many other cases, an elite-level settlement between the military leaders of the ethnic revolutionary groups and the Tatmadaw leaders that leaves their economic interests and their, their sort of interests in terms of political control and authority intact in their separate spheres uh, and doesn't really allow for sufficient inputs from civil society, from women's groups, from local uh, communities. All of the groups that have um, you know, have really contributed to monitoring uh, the Tamadal over the years, to monitoring the uh, the violations of, of these ethnic armed groups as well. Uh, and and I, I, I'm, I'm worried that that's the best scenario that we get, that we're not really going to get um, a, a sort of community-led uh, political process um, after that. So I, ha I had this great line uh, for, the, for the end of this where I was going to say with that cheery picture, I'm going to turn it over to, to Andrew, who I'm sure is going to tell you all sorts of wonderful things about how well the constitutional reform process is going in Myanmar. Um, but he's, he's uh, not yeah. here to do that. So I, I think maybe we'll <coughs> do mean, some questions here. Exactly. Two, two things. First of all, let me introduce uh, Jens Wardner as well to the discussion. Um, Jens is a uh, colleague of mine who uh, is responsible for the armed conflict database here at the Institute. Uh, in, particular, uh, in particular, monitoring the, the conflicts taking place in Southeast Asia and has just returned from uh, a research trip in, in Yangon. So I'll leave it to him to, to make a few remarks and, and perhaps a few questions. My, my own uh, sort of question leading into perhaps a, a slightly uh, elongated uh, discussion would be, uh, you know, how do you see, uh, will political chaos worsen uh, in, in, in the next year or so? Is, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any clear signs that this is wrapping up. Um, how is this permeating politically? Is there an appropriation of uh, Buddhist nationalism for political ends? Uh, do you see that taking place? Or, and, and perhaps simultaneously, uh, is there an increasing political fatigue uh, uh, at the uh, pace of uh, political reform and the, the perceived consequences of that, which many people, are, including uh, I'm sure in the military, uh, uh, see religious violence as being one of those consequences. Yeah. Jens, yeah, so I don't know if you... Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Matthew, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I thought your point on the complexity of identities uh, Politically, religious, etc. It's very interesting, and uh, the, you know, the kind of organic nature of the, the violence and riots you mentioned is, is quite wor worrying. Um, first, I had a question on the inter intercommunal violence. Uh, that also speaks a bit to what Herve mentioned. Um, so, when I visited Yangon last month, it was put to me that these riots um, are not necessarily as spontaneous as they appear, and that they may indeed be orchestrated by various forces within possibly the parliament, uh, the military, uh, in an attempt uh, to build a sort of political platform or to galvanize voters ahead of the 2015 elections, uh, with of course Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and the NLD seen as uh, taking the, the kind of foreign side of the argument uh, and meaning to protect uh, the, the minorities. Uh, to what extent do you think that's actually true? And uh, on the ceasefire process and continued fighting, I think a lot of the clashes uh, are stemming from the problem that um, the areas of control in Katsin and Shan states uh, are not clearly demarcated. And I think that's a problem that's recognized actually by both sides. And uh, additionally, there may be a problem, uh, of course, uh, both sides are involved in various uh, parts of the uh, sort of illegal economy, including logging. 
and there may be some uh, local dynamics there between even local uh, technical commanders, possibly, uh, that may also be causing this. Um, but my, my uh, impression from my visit uh, was that uh, despite these clashes, um, people are, had a general uh, sense of optimism uh, that the, uh, the ceasefire uh, agreement should <coughs> be concluded before 2015, as it is in the interest of all the parties, including the ones who are fighting. Uh, and that the, the main worry is that there's not really any thinking or proper thinking about what comes afterwards. You mentioned the political dialogue right. and uh, the complications with bringing in you know, not just the armed groups in government anymore, it's also possibly civil society groups, uh, political parties, etc. So I just wanted to uh, maybe speak a bit to your expectations for that process and also the risks it entails. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you guys for for these excellent sort of comments and, and questions. Uh, and I'll just sort of take the opportunity to talk about them a bit since Andrew is, is working his way here. Um, I'm going to start with the, the, the second part first, asking about the peace process. Um, and I think you're right, one, you know, one of the challenges is that, that areas of control are not clearly demarcated. Uh, one of the you know, one of the sticking points in the National Ceasefire Agreement, it's been a sticking point in virtually every ceasefire agreement that the Tamadol has signed, is the codes of conduct, right? What are the interim arrangements going to be? Uh, and this, this to me is not a, the outlook is, is not good. Uh, if we look at, at the past, um, you know, everybody was very excited when the Karen several years ago assigned a historic ceasefire with the Tamadol, ending what, you know, many people had called the, the, the world's longest civil war. Um, yet, while there seemed to be in the weeks following that uh, sort of preliminary ceasefire agreement, agreement that the code of conduct would be accepted and signed soon after that, it wasn't. And it still hasn't been, right? So we're years out now from this ceasefire that is holding, right, but doesn't have an agreed upon code of conduct, right? And, and I think that that, that, that um, sort of gives us some, some reason to be pessimistic about uh, you know about even if there is an NCA that's signed, whether these areas of control and and um, the agreements about what sorts of activities are appropriate in what sorts of areas, whether there's going or there's the potential for for agreement on that. Um, you know, I think the the question of the illegal economy, I think it's absolutely true, right? I mean, none of these ethnic revolutionary groups, uh, either they're armed or political wings, are uh, Boy Scouts or whatever the UK version of Boy Scouts is. Um, or you know, or necessarily good citizens, uh, but and and many of them are involved in illegal trade, right? I mean, there's timber, there's of course heroin, opium, all these sorts of things. Um, I I think the challenge here, and 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 the part that I think is a bit disingenuous on the on the part of of the the Tamadol is that uh, in many circumstances there are de facto agreements, right? Gentlemen's agreements on the ground about who's going to run things through and who's going to profit from these. And, and those hold in many cases, but there are moments when uh, the military says, no, part of our job is to act as police and we are going to stop the flow of illegal goods here. Um, and I think it's disingenuous because it seems a bit arbitrary, or if not arbitrary, targeted politically you know, at a certain group at a certain time. So, of course, there's lots of smuggling that is going to continue to be an issue, I think, even if a ceasefire is signed, even if there's progress in uh, political dialogue. Who knows what's <coughs> going to happen with the United Wa State Army. Um, they're armed to the teeth, really powerful, really autonomous, uh, and, and not a part of this um, process directly. Uh, so, you know, that, that's kind of worrying to me. Um, it, it, it's also, I think, sort of worrying that um, with so much of the focus on the need for a ceasefire, right, and the need for a ceasefire to come first, now that most of the ethnic revolutionary groups have agreed that they will sign a ceasefire first as long as there's a kind of promise that political dialogue will, will occur soon afterwards, uh, is that nobody's really been talking about what that political dialogue looks like, right? And, and by not initiating, it, it, this happens on, on small levels, right? CBOs talk about this, NGOs talk about the ways that they want to have input into the process. Um, you know, but, but without more national, kind of inclusive, creative, far-thinking you know, uh, discussions on what this process could be, 
we end up hearing conversations like, oh, let's remember how awful the, the uh, National Assembly was that was writing the Constitution, where you just got hundreds of people in a room and they argued and no one really gets their, their uh, interests and, and it just stalls the political process, right? I mean, that's the worry, is that what happens for political dialogue is that it's just getting hundreds and hundreds of people representing every single group into a room with no real input process, no real feedback process, uh, and that allows the ruling party or the military or, or anybody else to say, look, we told you that this wasn't going to work. Let's just move this process forward like they did with the constitutional reform. So, it, you know, that that's one thing I think that worries me about that. Um, I'll, I'll say something pretty quickly about uh, some of these. I'm sure we're going to come back to some of the details of Everybody, you ask these huge sweeping questions, right? So, um, but but to 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 speak a little bit about the political chaos and then who's involved, um, you know, th this chaos or violence um, has been happening in lots of different places, right? I mean, it's it's more uh, it seems more apparent. It seems to strike uh, more firmly when it's in a place like Mandalay or when it's close to to Yangon, right? But I mean, th this is happening in in small places. Uh, for religious reasons, for ethnic reasons, um, across the country, uh, and and um, you know, so I so I think we we notice it when it happens in in uh, you know in Yangon or in the places that that uh, where there are a lot of people and where there's a more a sort of more open um, political framework. But in terms of the political appropriation of, of Buddhist nationalism and, and and this question, Jens, of uh, I'll attribute a phrase to you that you didn't use, but the question of the invisible hand, right? Who or what is is orchestrating this? It's really, really difficult to say, right? And and I kind of hedge on this question um, because I think we don't have a lot of evidence, right? And and th that's why I think it was important um, the the point that I made before that we it's it's not really safe I think to assume that. Thane Sane has this Buddhist nationalist agenda, or that, that uh, Ushue Man, the Speaker of Parliament, has this Buddhist nationalist agenda. I think we should, want, number one, not forget that they are both Buddhists and Myanmar Buddhists as civilians and lay people as well, right? So, so they can be convinced by these same arguments. But number two, they are subjected to public political pressure, right? In a way that, that former military governments didn't have to deal with. And so, you know, they can't be seen as not responding to tens of thousands of, of people of, of Rakhine Buddhists marching in, uh, you know, in Sitwe. There seems to be more than enough evidence uh, to suggest that some of these riots were orchestrated in certain ways, right? That people were provided with materials, that people were organized in, in some sense, um, you know, the, the, there were reports that in Mandalay a few days before the actual riots broke out that people were seeing kind of gangs of, of youths on motorcycles um, and, and that there were more kind of random or, or orchestrated attacks on, you know, just say driving by on your motorcycle and breaking the car of, uh, or breaking the window of a car of somebody who uh, was presumed to be Muslim. Um, so I, I think there's evidence um, to say that there are people who have high connections and access to, to resources who are organizing this to some degree or supporting this to some degree. But I don't think that we can say, I don't think that we have the evidence to say that this is either government controlled or directed or military controlled or directed. And part of that comes back to the fact that, you know, we need to disaggregate the military and the government, right? To recognize that there are a lot of different perspectives within um, those two groups. Now, it's, I think, a different question to say, can the military or military-aligned parties like the ruling USDP party benefit from this, right? And I think that they certainly can, right? There's a way for them to frame this where, uh, you know, where they paint this as, as the response to uncertainty caused by, uh, you know, a possible changeover in, in, um, in rulership and or leadership in, in 2015, right? I mean, they can, you know, they can do a framing like that that allows them to, to uh, you know, to benefit from this. And, and certainly, individual political parties and MPs uh, are, are kind of taking advantage of these Buddhist uh, nationalist sentiments, which is to be expected in a case like this. Um, so I, I think we can, we can say that, right? But I, I, don't, I just don't think that there's evidence to support this sort of broad, invisible hand um, argument. Could be the case. 
just not enough evidence to say.